Hi, everybody. Welcome back. If, uh, if you'd like, we'll get started with our second presentation. This one will be on invasive viburnums, which we are finding a lot of out in the ecosystems of Long Island and New York City. So Dr. Anthony Cullen is going to give us some tips on identification, pathways of spread and management of these invasive viburnums. Tony's a plant ecologist who focuses on invasive species while a PhD candidate at Rutgers University, Newark. Tony's research investigated dispersal and distribution of two invasive viburnum shrubs, the Linden viburnum and Seibold's viburnum. He employed an interdisciplinary approach that incorporated spatial modeling and landscape genetics with field-based ecological experiments. Dr. Cullen is talking to us today about his research, dispersal pathways and pollinator resources, and thoughts on how to manage non-native viburnums and to pass along some reliable diagnostics to ID viburnum in the field, which we found to be tricky sometimes. So please welcome Dr. Tony Cullen, and we'll make you a co-host. Yeah, I, I believe I am. Thank you, Bill. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Um, yeah, sure can. Uh, I'm just going to pick the desktop view here, share, and everybody can see the presentation? Yes, looks good. Thank you. All right. Great. Well, thank you all for having me today. I'm really excited to talk to you about viburnums. It was my life and still is to a large extent for the last uh, eight years, nine years. Um, so like Bill said, uh, we're going we're gonna to kind of delve into the family, how to ID it, and then kind of talk about some non-natives in the, in the area, you know. Um, so without further ado, um, let's just jump right into it. Oh, let's see. There we go. Uh, so a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a New Jersey native. I grew up right across the river. <laughs> um, however, a lot of my field work was conducted in uh, New York City and Long Island. Um, I had some field sites over there, which I'll get into a little bit later. Uh, I did my PhD at Rutgers University, uh, the Newark campus, and um, did a lot of urban ecology in that lab. That was with uh, Dr. Klaus Ozalpel. And um, we also did invasive species. And so I'm a plant community ecologist, and my specialty while I was doing research there was uh, viburnums, um, which, which are really a uh, common native plant, although we do have several uh, invasives. So let's get into it. Um, so the outline for today's talk is, is pretty straightforward. We're going to talk about the viburnum family generally and how we distinguish natives from non-natives. Uh, then we're going to move into the pathways of spread. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, viburnum pollinators and the potential for hybridization. And then at the very end, uh, it saves a, a couple slides of talk with man about management of of these invasive viburnum. So uh, if you're familiar with viburnum, this will not be any surprise to you, but uh, viburnum is part of Dipsicales, uh, specifically Odoxiaceae. Uh, they're in the same family of Sambucus. Um, and so that's really what we're gonna be focusing on today. We're not gonna be looking at, at any Caprifoliaceae, but we do have invasive Caprifoliaceae, as a lot of you know, we have, um, uh, Lanceria, which is, you know, the honeysuckle, bush honeysuckle, which is equally problematic, uh, and, and a couple others. So the family uh, is, is known to spread. Uh, I guess it's a family trait. Uh, it's a pretty, it's not the most species rich family. I, th I believe there's about, depending on who you ask, if you're a lumper or a splitter, there's about 170 uh, species of viburnum, but over 70 species of those are used for horticultural purposes. So um, you can see how this could be problematic because if people are planting non-natives in, in front of their houses or in their gardens, you know, the, and, and they have these really nice berries, this could be a potential pathway to spread. 
um, because birds love fruit, but we'll get into that. Um, uh, viburnum is really distributed across the world on, on mostly every continent. Um, they're in temperate and, and tropical regions of, 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 of the earth, right? Um, you can pretty much find a viburnum anywhere. In fact, I went to uh, Colombia, South America, uh, a couple of years ago for the pandemic, and um, and I was able to to find a, a, a viburnum, which made me very very happy to that I could leave the country and still find uh, the specimen, uh, this genus that I love so much. So here's what I want you to do: if you have the ability to, I want you to go to this poll uh everywhere it's it's pollev.com and backslash tony cullen 732 and it's going to ask you your name you can skip that what i want you to do is i want you to enter in all the key characteristics that come to mind when you think about viburnum and if you can't do this you can type it in the chat too feel free um, but if you can uh, it's going to create a word cloud uh, it will be fun to see kind of what people associate with viburnum. So I'm going to give it a, a minute and then we'll see, we'll see what the results are. In fact, I'm going to switch to that screen and see if people have already started typing stuff in. Okay, maybe not. So let me leave the link up there for a little bit longer. And of course, if you can't visit this web page, just throw it in the chat. That's fine too. What you think of when you think of viburnum. While we're waiting, Tom, I'm using non-native invasive. Some of these non-natives are invasive and we'll get in, into that. So let's see, has everybody got that address? And please type it in the chat, let's see. Um, what? Oh no. Oh, here we go. Beautiful. It worked. And it's it's still, people are still populating it. All right. So we got berries. We got opposite, right? Everybody thinks opposite, opposite branching. That's great. Inflorescent, droops, perfect. Beetle. Oh, yeah. The the we can talk about the beetle. Um, <laughs> there's lots of them. Yeah. Flat top flowers, arrangement. <laughs> Confusing. Oh no. Hopefully I can dispel some of the confusion. Um, you know, I've learned a lot about uh, viburnums over the past eight or nine years. I still don't know everything. And even sometimes I have trouble IDing them. Uh, and as conventions change and names change, it certainly can be really, really confusing. All right, so this is great. This is exactly what I wanted. Um, so let me get back to the presentation here. So, Something I don't think I saw, but it's a, it's an obvious feature. But it is a it is a feature, right? Viburnums are shrubs. They're they're shrubs to 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 small subcanopy trees. Um, so that's that's something, right? We know they're shrubs or, or trees. They can be trees, right? So that's what we're looking for. In case you've never seen a viburnum in your life, that's what that's what we're doing, right? That's 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 what we're keying in on. Of course, that's not super helpful, right? There's a lot of shrubs out there, a lot of subcanopy trees. So yeah, opposite branching. That was something else that was in that word cloud. I was really happy to see that. Uh, it's a really key diagnostic feature. It'll at least get you to to the okay. Well, we're in this family because there's only you know certain plants that have opposite branching. You think of maples. You think of viburnum, right? There's there are several others we could list here. Um, and there it is, right? There's your opposite branching. You can really see that pretty well. Um, not only just the, uh, the leaves, but even on the picture on the right-hand side here, if you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see the branching, right? Everything is, is opposite. Um, of course, there's some other diagnostic features in this picture, but we'll get to that a little later on. Okay. so. Uh, viburnum also have a simple leaf. Oh, I, I totally missed the chat. Lovely flowers, nice fall colors, berries, uh, pollinator attractive, and uh, natives. Yeah, yeah, a lot of great natives. Um, so they have a simple leaf. 
And this is important because when we're talking about viburnum, oop, I didn't mean to go ahead. When we're talking about viburnum, um, you know, people confuse sometimes what a simple leaf means, um, but it's key. A simple leaf means it's self-contained, right? It's not attached to other leaves, right? So even it can be lobed like this picture on the far left. Um, like it looks like a maple leaf, it has lobes. It can be, you know, the margin of the leaf can be entire. You know, it can be, it can be toothed, it can be, but as long as it's one leaf, it's, it's a viburnum, right? And the other thing too, that's important is there's no compound leaf, but Sambucus, its cousin, which looks a lot like it, um, when you, especially when you look at the flowers, let's, let's see, that, wow, those are, but those flowers are very conserved within the family uh, between Sambucus and, um, and Viburnum. So, you know, they have these really, they have this uh, syme is what they call it, and they have all these little florets and these white creamy flowers with these, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're fertile flowers, although sometimes they can also have a ring of infertile flowers, um, but the leaves aren't compound, but uh, the, its cousin, the Sambucus, are. Um, so that's a good way to distinguish like, okay, I'm in the family, but this is not a viburnum. This is, this is Sambucus. Um, another way is, yeah, flowers. Flowers are a good way that uh, no matter what species you're looking at, the flower morphology is really conserved. Like I said, it's this little white flower, um, you know, uh, and, and so you can either have a, a fully fertile flower, like on the left here, or you can have a flower that is ringed with, uh, on the outside with infertile flowers. Um, and we could talk maybe more about that later as to why, why they have that. I'm sure folks might already know. Uh, and then in the center are the fertile flowers. So, so those are good um, characteristics that Simon fluorescent um, there's other flowers that do look like that, um, you know, dogwoods, some of the shrub dogwoods, not the, not like the cornice, but other, or not the cornice, uh, not the cornice Florida, but other, other shrub dogwoods like Ramosa and, um, uh, I'm blanking on the other two, but, uh, I, the, can, can have similar flowers. Um, so it's not, it's not, you know, but along with the other features, you know, it's, it's, it's a good feature. And then, of course, like uh, was mentioned in the word cloud, um, they have bright, uh, they have droops, right? And a droop simply means is it's it's a fleshy fruit with a stone um, stone seed in the middle, and they can range anywhere from really bright red, like on the left here, to um, really dark, uh, you know, uh, bluish purple, and then anywhere in between, they can be uh, like bicolor here, where as they're maturing, they're, they, they blush to, to pink, to red, and then eventually to, to blue or purple. Um, so just some things to look out for. And then this isn't a diagnostic feature per se, but it is, it is an important feature because they have opposite branching. Sometimes, especially with these naked buds, this is the hobble bush on the right-hand side. They've been said to have these praying hands, right? Um, and you can think of it like that. If you're not overly religious, you can think of it uh, another way. You know, two two people, you know, <laughs> uh, high fiving, whatever you want to think of it. But but it has that those because it's opposite. It has that. And so on the right here with the hobble bush, some some viburnum have these. Uh, they don't have leaf scales, and the uh, the leaf primordia are naked. And then some do, and then you see this, you could think of that the same way with this praying hands or, or even the scale too is the way it's dissected. It's dissected right down the middle. And so you have a leaf scale on either side. And so you get that. Um, all right, so oops, let's move on. So in summary, you know, when you're looking, these are some things that will really help you distinguish what a viburnum is. If you already know this stuff, this is, this is very basic, but we're gonna get into how to distinguish between the species now that we've um, kind of listed what makes a viburnum a viburnum. So yeah, how do, how do we tell them all apart? I mean, I know this is very frustrating. I know from personal experience, 
um, when I think I have something keyed out and I'm just not sure, or with some species like Linden viburnum, uh, where there's multiple cultivars, I think there's something like, I forget if it's 17 or 27. There's, there's a, some of these have a lot of different cultivars and you're not sure which is escaping from, you know, which home from where. And so it's really hard to know, like, oh, is this a Michael Dodge uh, Linden viburnum or is this a Cardinal Candy uh, viburnum, uh, Linden viburnum? In, in my estimation for, for what we do, I don't think it, it matters. If you know it's a non-native, if you know it's an invasive, um, you know, that's really what you got to get it down to. So let's talk about how do we tell them all apart? Okay, so because I was in university for so long and I did a lot of teaching, I can't help but sneak a quiz in. I'm sorry. <laughs> what I want to know is what arrow wood it is. And I will tell you, I'll at least tell you this, that there are indeed three distinct arrow woods on, this is the roof of my car <laughs> during field season. Um, so here's what I'll do. I'll make it a little easier for you. I'll draw a line down uh, and I'll say A, B, or C. Let's first start. Which one do you think is the non-native or if you prefer the term invasive, uh, that's fine. Just put it in the chat, whether you think it's A or B or C, which one is the non-native species here? I agree, Tom, non-native does not equal invasive. I like to start off saying non-native because um, invasive depends on where you are and what the population is. So non-native, they're all, can call it non-native and, and still be okay and not, not put that invasive term, even though it, it could be invasive somewhere. And there's a lot of natives that are, can be invasive, like, uh, you know, cattails and red maple swamps. So. Yeah, it's a, okay, so we got a couple answers in. People are leaning towards the right hand side of, of the, the, the either B or C, B and C. Oh, I like that, hedging bets. Okay, so this is great. So does anybody want to turn on, you don't have to, but does anybody either want to put in the chat or turn on your mic as to why you selected B or C? And you can type it in the chat too, if you're uncomfortable uh, popping on. Deep things, okay. All right. Let's see, I'm gonna I'm gonna reveal the answer, but you, ooh, let's see. Looks flashy. Okay. Oh, a. Oh, we got an A in there. All right. Okay. So I'm gonna reveal the answer, but you can still type in stuff in the chat. Uh, so here we go. So we got uh, Recognitum, um, which is sometimes referred to as the Northern Arrowwood. It's also sometimes referred to as V dentatum variety, uh, uh, what is it, lucidarium, or I forget what it is. I don't, I don't use that term, so I don't, I don't remember the name. But it's some, it's referred to as a northern um, arrowwood or, or or smooth arrowwood. Uh, then there is V dentatum, which is sometimes referred to as just arrowwood or southern arrowwood. And then you have uh, the dilatatum on, on the right-hand side, which is indeed uh, your, your non-native, right? And so how do we tell these apart? Like I'm out in the field, I'm pulling my hair out because I don't know 
what what's going on because the leaves look very similar and does it have pubescence on the on the leaf or the stem? How, how do we tell this apart? So um, the best way to tell at least the natives apart before you even get to the invasives. So I, I put several pictures up here. And so the 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 dentatum um, has uh, hair, right? Because V. reconitum is smooth arrowwood. So you would assume it doesn't have any hair. So to get to, to separate the, the two natives, you know, you can look at hairs. And um, so let's, let's get into that a little bit more. So the only way you're gonna see hairs is you gotta have a, 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 a scope, right? You gotta have a magnifying glass, you know, um, whether you're just getting into this or, or you, you've been botanizing for years, a hand, a hand lens is invaluable to really see the features that you need to see sometimes ID. So I recommend that everybody kind of get a hand lens if, if this is something that you know, you're doing a lot. So when you do that, when you take the hand lens, right, and you magnify it, you're able to see on, on the one on the left, which I'm gonna tell you is the dentatum, um, you see all these hairs and these hairs, if you, the picture is a little blurry, but I'm gonna tell you that if you actually put that under your hand lens, you're gonna see what's called stellate hairs. And that's pretty, it's not actually a scary word, stellate star, right? It looks like little star, tufts of star hair, right? Five or six little hairs there. On the uh, recunitum, what you're gonna see is, maybe no hairs, or if you see some hairs, they're gonna be strigo. So it's gonna be short little hairs, individuals standing on their own, or you might not see anything. You can see this on the stem or the leaves. Um, and that's a good way to tell them apart. Um, now, I don't know on Long Island, you know, I think a lot of people call most things dentatum, but I, I learned this distinction from somebody who is actually a better botanist than I am about how to make this distinction, how to tell them apart. Um, so this, this, is, this is a good way in my estimation. All right, so we know how to tell these two apart, but I, I still haven't told you how to tell uh, this other one apart. So what, what can we look at? Well, um, we know one has in the native, uh, one has a smooth stem, the other has stellate hairs. It's great, we can separate those. I can tell you with the uh, dil uh, dilatatum that it has really dense hair. Um, it's very hairy. So if you know that it's very hairy, well, you can eliminate the recunitum, right? Because there's not a lot of hair on that. It's glabrous or, or you know, it's got uh, strigos hairs. But you can clump together the, the, the southern arrowwood and the linden uh, viburnum or linden arrowwood, right? And then I think the easiest way to tell these apart, although I could, I could be, maybe, maybe people think I'm out of my mind is, when you look at the leaves, um, dentatum fits its name, it's dentate. The leaf is dentate, which means it's tooth, right? It has teeth, right? So if you look at the margin of the leaf, you have these really, um, uh, you know, really great uh, tooth, uh, mar tooth margin. You don't really actually get that on the, on the dilatatum uh, a lot, you know, maybe when the leaves are younger, but when the leaves are more mature, you really get, it's more what I would call a serrated um, edge or margin. Also the leaf shape is, can be very different. You can see um, the leaf here on the right, uh, it's very wide and then it narrows to this little um, tip at the end. I don't know if you all can see my cursor when I do this, I can see it, but I don't know if you can, but. If, if you're looking at the bottom of the picture or the right, it comes to like a little point at the end. And not that the uh, dentatum doesn't do this. Okay, good. <laughs> not that the dentatum doesn't do this, um, but it just does it in a different way. So, you, you know, it's this flat edge, sometimes maybe heart shape. And it, it, it gradually, you know, comes to the point where this one kind of maybe more abruptly. So I think that's a really good key feature. But if you're like, you know, I can't do that, Tony, you're, you're out of your mind. I have another way. So the other way is I told you it's hairy, but what I didn't tell you is that there's little orange lenticels uh, on the stem 
And that's a pretty reliable diagnostic uh, to tell the, say, southern arrowwood from uh, the linden arrowwood or, or viburnum, whatever you want to call it. That, that's the other tricky thing about viburnums is that depending on who you ask, they're, they're named a lot of different things. So I try to use the, the Latin names as much as I can. Um, but that's, that's really how you can tell the, apart those three, because those three are tricky. If you're in a wood lot and you're looking at viburnum, uh, it can be confusing fast because there's a lot of, even within a species or with, on a shrub, uh, the leaf morphology can vary a great deal, whether you're looking at younger leaves or older leaves, or depending on what time of the year it is, like leaves are starting to uh, not look as great at this time of the year. And sometimes you, you can't key in on those features. So that, I think that's a really solid way if you're still undecided to, to throw it over into the dilatatum realm as opposed to uh, the dentatum. Another thing that this sets them apart, right? I like to use multiple diagnostics because I don't think leaves are enough and stems are enough or buds are enough. You know, if, if you're like me, you might revisit sites time and time again to key out things. So if you can wait it out, you know, you can always wait till the fruit comes out and all the both natives, whether you're talking about the Reconitum or the Dentatum have dark, you know, blue fruit, not dark blue, but blue fruit. Um, and the fruit's really round it. It's, it's, a, it's a round. And the, the Dilatatum has bright red fruit and never have any other color. Even the cultivars I've seen don't have any other color. And the fruit's more ovoid or oval. Um, they're not as rounded. Um, they kind of look like a raisin, maybe, um, that they have that shape to it. And so that's a really awesome. Also, the, the dilatatum, and we'll get to this later in the talk, they tend to stay on the shrub a lot longer, where most of the natives, because of uh, the, pro, uh, not the protein content, the fat content, they have really high fat content, birds are going to love those, and they're going to pick them before they pick the non-natives. Uh, so that's a, that's a really good way to, uh, to distinguish. All right, so I'm gonna keep moving because I don't wanna spend the whole talk talking about how to ID, but I know this is important uh, for folks because you're doing this work daily. And they, so, you know, they're similar, they have very similar flowers. So that can be a, another way in which they can be confusing, um, but it's good to point out, but all, all three of them have the fertile flowers, neither of them have the sterile flowers. Okay, so black haw or, or nanny berry. Um, I'm going to teach you a reliable trick, at least when the leaves are on, that I learned, I think is pretty good. Um, but I'm also going to teach you a trick when the leaves aren't on. Um, so they look a lot alike, and I'm not telling you which is which yet, um, but they look a lot alike. And, and, and sometimes when the nanny berry, the viburnum lentago is bigger, you can tell the difference. They, they just, they don't, you know, but, but if you're looking at something younger, you might not be able to tell the difference. So for, for me, this is actually pretty straightforward. When the leaves are on, um, the prunifolium, the petiole, right, this little red part here, it doesn't have, it, it's very straight. It doesn't have, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's, well, it's just straight. <laughs> but here on, on the right, the lentago has this wavy uh, line along the petiole. And I often, when I think about it, so I like to like attach IDs with ideas. So you can like, oh, what did Tony say? Oh yeah, it looks like the bottom lip of a dog. Cause it does to me, I don't know. You can come up with your own ideas, but when I look at my dog's lip, you know, and I see all those little bumps on the lower lip, that's what I think of when I think of Lentago. And that's how I differentiate them. But there's really another good way if that's not something, you know, this is again where hand lens comes in handy. Um, the buds are really different. So if you're doing winter ID and you're trying to distinguish between the two, um, the Lentago has this really cool uh, bud that like, you know, comes to that point and actually is curved at the top where the prunifolium or, or the, the black haw is, um, it, just like, it's, the bud is pretty well contained. You can see again, with both of those, like that line dissecting them in the middle, you know, where you can think about praying hands again or, or two people high-fiving, whatever, uh, either or. But um, 
but there's a really distinct difference between the buds. So you got a good summer ID, you got a good winter ID to tell the two apart. Um, and so I, I think that's a pretty reliable diagnostic. And then, but what's, were there not similar, you know, again, the flowers are very similar and the fruit is very similar. Uh, so leaf, leaf and buds are probably the best way to go with those two. And those two are both natives. Um, so cranberry bush or maple leaf viburnum. Again, I'm not gonna tell you which is which yet, um, but there is a really reliable uh, diagnostic for this. Um, the first thing is if it's flowering, if it has that uh, sterile ring around it, well, it's not acerfolium, it's, it's opulus uh, or opulus. Um, so that's one way. So if you're out in the spring and things are flowering, that's a good way to tell them apart. Uh, the acerfolium also has a hairy stem. Um, but a, a really key diagnostic is um, there's these little uh, glands at the base of the leaf where the, the petiole meets the leaf. And you probably can't see it in this picture. That's kind of why I circled it. But on the left, the opulus has these little bumps at the base of the, the where the petiole connects to the leaf. The acerfolium does not have that. And so if you want to distinguish between the two and it's, you know, the leaves are out, that's a really good way to determine. Now, within um, uh, the, what you'd call the cranberry bush, there is the American and the European, and that's a lot trickier. And I'm going to try to give you a good tip today to distinguish that, but that I, even I have trouble with this sometimes. But um, if you look at uh, what I'm calling, uh, you know, basically uh, the variety opulus. So it'd be viburnum opulus, variety opulus, which would be the European. European um, tends to have more of these glands along the petiole, but that is actually not super reliable because the American variety can have some too. The more reliable uh, ID is if you look at the glands, the uh, opulus is uh, concave, right? And the American one is, is, is not. There's, there are little bumps, but the, they don't uh, indent at all. Um, so that's a really good uh, way to kind of tell them apart. This is one of those ones that maybe you try once you get confident with viburnums. Uh, I wouldn't start off with this, but there I know out on Long Island, because I've done bio blitzes out that way, that they're definitely the, the European cranberry bush. So it's something you might run into. Um, of course, another thing that sets the, the cranberry bush apart from the acerfolium is just, again, the, the droops. Um, droops on the cranberry bush are bright red. They kind of almost look like, if you've ever seen hobble bush berries, they're that, that bright red, that rounded. Uh, the acerfolium are not as rounded, they're more oval, and of course they're, they're dark uh, blue and black. Okay, so I'm almost at the end, uh, which I feel like was a lot of my, uh, almost at the end of IDs, because we got to move on. Um, but the last IDs are, are uh, so we, we talked about dilatatum, which is a non-native and, 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 and also an invasive uh, that's moving, uh, especially in New Jersey, and it sounds like in New York as well. Um, but there's also Seabold's viburnum. Uh, uh, so Seabold, Von Seabold was a, a, a he was a, a doctor, but he was also a botanist and he, he lived in Japan and he named a lot of things. So you might run across his name for several different plants. Um, and this is one of the plants he, he named. Um, the best diagnostic with this, honestly, the, the number one is rip a leaf or break a branch. It, it's kind of like Alanthus or Tree of Heaven, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it smells, and, and the smell has been described to me as like a mix between um, taking a bell pepper like and, and crushing a bell pepper, and you get that smell from the, the pepper, and, and like a burning tire. Uh, it's, it's not a pleasant smell, and it's a really, and plus there's not a lot of other leaves that look like it. Um, but that's a really good way to, to know that you have a Seabold's viburnum. Uh, and the fruit uh, tends to, you know, it goes from green to that pinkish to red 
to black. So if it looks like it's a multicolored fruit, um, that's, a, that's also a good way. But honestly, crush a leaf. You'll know right away that it's a Seabolds viburnum. And then some other ones that you, you all are probably seeing, and we, I've talked about with you, is um, uh, the T viburnum and the, the uh, Japanese snowball, so the placatum and uh, set to Gerard. So I don't say this one a lot because I don't, I don't ever talk about it that much, but it is, it is, um, it is becoming seen a lot more. Uh, I can't give you great diagnostics on these only because I haven't dealt with them a lot. My research focused on Seabold and Linden. Um, you know, here, you know, you can see some key diagnostics here as fruit color. And, and so the, the, the tea has a fertile leaf, no sterile, uh, or not fertile leaf, fertile flower, uh, no, no, no sterile flowers. The fruit is red. It's kind of distinct because it has this, you know, uh, oval shaped leaf where a lot of the other viburnums don't. Uh, and the margin is entire. There's no serration on it that, that I'm aware of. Um, where the placatum, the one on the right, um, has this really big showy flower um, with the sterile flowers. Uh, it has this serrated leaf um, and the fruit, for this can be anywhere from red to bluish. It depends on the season. So it has bicolor fruit, but just something to keep an eye out for because you are gonna see some more of that. Uh, and you, I think you already are. So with that, I'm gonna, unless there's any questions, I know I kind of blew through that. Um, I'm gonna move to kind of the research portion to kind of talk about my work. So if there's any questions, throw them in the chat and I'll, I'll respond, otherwise I'm gonna move on. So I'm gonna, I wanna talk a little bit about pathways. So why are we seeing them in, in, in the forests and the parks? Um, so, you know, uh, here's where I call them invaders, right? So these non-native viburnum are invasive. Um, they're invasive they're in New Jersey and New York and several other states. Uh, and what I researched was uh, the dilatatum and the Seaboldii. So the linden and the and the Seabold viburnum, um, and uh, this these maps are actually a little outdated. I, I realized a little too late. Uh, I couldn't make the change in time. But um, uh, used to be it used to be eight states for the uh, dilatatum, and and I think it was like ten states or twelve states for Seaboldii. Now it's actually uh, I think. 10 for the dilatatum and 13 for the Seaboldii. So they're found in a lot of places and they were introduced a, quite a long time ago, but it's really been within the past 30 years that we've seen them uh, volunteering in our, in our forests and parks. And you can see with both invasions, it's mostly Northern New Jersey, uh, New York City and Long Island are, are where the invasions are most prevalent. So luck, lucky us, right, uh, that, that we get to have these in our backyard. Um, of course, uh, you know, like a lot of invasives, unfortunately, they uh, ha have come over. Uh, so the viburnum uh, dilatatum is from China, North Korea, and Japan. The Seaboldii actually only, from what I'm aware of, is only native to Japan. So it has a very limited range in its native uh, country. Um, and so when I started doing my research, what I, the first thing I noticed is, is, hey, there's a difference in how these fruits persist on the shrub. And I thought, well, this is interesting because something's eating these and something's dispersing this. And what does that landscape look like? Because, you know, until I started, there was very little, in fact, I don't think there's still any work being done on this. Um, I hope to get another paper out soon about this, looking at spatial data, but um, there's been very little work done on these two uh, species of viburnum. And what I noticed was simply is that the, the Seabold's viburnum, the fruit was being eaten very quickly. Uh, by, the, by, the, by September, most of the fruit was gone and, and the uh, dilatatum, wasn't. It stayed on to winter. Sometimes the fruit was never eaten. Eaten. Um, so this is my paper. I think this is maybe how you, you all found me. I'm glad folks are reading it. Uh, you know. So uh, so my co-authors uh, Kathleen Farley and Susan Smith and my my advisors Frank and Klaus. 
uh, we got together and uh, started researching. And what we really wanted to find out is what was driving this change in feeding preference. You don't need to read the hypothesis. The, the, the theory that we had or the hypothesis that we had simply was that it was driven by nutrient content. It just seemed to make a lot of sense to us. Like if you're a migrating bird, you want to you wanna eat fruit that, that has a lot of fat in it so you can do what you need to do. And so we set up our research out in New Jersey at, at two parks, Foster Fields and Lewis Morris. Uh, we did avian point count surveys throughout the parks. We also set up game cameras because after a pilot study, we realized, you know, birds are ephemeral and we weren't catching as many as we hoped to. So we also set up game cameras around the fruit. And we did exp exclusion, ex exclusion experiments to see like, if the fruit was left alone, if no animal or insect could get to it, how long would it stay on versus when it wasn't excluded? And so we also did nutritional analysis. Uh, Susan Smith, Dr. Susan Smith Pagano did that for us. Uh, and so those are my undergrads working and, 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 and dissecting the fruits so we could ship it off for analysis. And what we found was while Viburnum ciboldii had, uh, you know, more uh, crude fat, more percentage of crude fat. Um, when, you, when you compare it to uh, the fall dilatatum, so these are both collected at the same time. Uh, dilatatum had more uh, antioxidants, which we found really interesting. So perhaps the higher antioxidants were one of the reasons why the fruit wasn't being eaten. And perhaps it was a, one reason why they could also persist on the shrub until winter because they were very well protected. But if you were a bird and you had to choose between the two invasives, you'd go with the one with higher fat. And sometimes color can be a signal, uh, that blue or black color can be a signal of, of, of you know, not a signal of the nutritional content. We also found that, um, you know, fruit harvested in the winter um, tended to have less um, antioxidants than fruits harvested in the fall. So we did see that there was a drop in the antioxidant uh, content, which would kind of suggest that, oh, okay, maybe it is more palatable when fall comes around uh, or no, when winter comes around because the antioxidant content has lowered so much and, and birds might find it palatable. And so this, this graph just shows that. It shows this is the frugivore exclusion experiment. The unenclosed ones um, dropped a lot sooner than the, than the enclosed ones, which wasn't a big shock. Uh, C. bolii was gone, most of it was gone by uh, the beginning of October, where uh, dil dilatatum held on till March and, and still didn't get all of its fruit eaten. And if you look at that, like as far as percentage is concerned, you see the peak for uh, dilatatum in the, in the winter, where you see the peak for C. bolii in the fall. So that suggests that whatever's eating it is eating it uh, whatever's eating Cebolia is eating it in the fall. And what we found is to probably nobody's surprise. Uh, it's one of those things that you research and you find something that probably most people know, but at least now it's in a journal is that Rob, uh, the cat birds are eating a lot of these Cebold, uh, Ciboldii and, and not a lot of other species. And, you know, cat birds, they, they can obviously be local, but during that time, they can also be migratory. You know, the, there's both. And we found that robins were mostly eating the, um, the dilatatum fruit, but they weren't really eating it until the winter. Our game cameras reliably count, or found that when we did see feeding, when we saw spikes in feeding, it was these robins ephemerally coming through the parks and in these big masses. A lot of times you see like snow on the ground um, feeding. Uh, and so, so there was a seasonality to it. They were waiting maybe till the fruit, you know, not that they know that the fruit has less antioxidants, but they found it more palatable in the winter than, the, than they did uh, in the fall. But what we also found, uh, oh, and, then, and that's just cat pictures of cat birds eating the, the seed. But we also were wondering, well, we did notice a, actually a pretty big drop in, in dilatatum in the fall. What, what was accounting for that? Because we weren't seeing birds feeding on it. Well, my, be uh, come to nobody's surprise. Well, it was chipmunks and squirrels. They were taking off whole cymes of, of infructescence at a time. And sometimes they dropped to the ground. Uh, sometimes they, they ate them right there. It didn't seem like they cached them, but, but we didn't actually follow them. We didn't, we didn't see where the seed was 
went to once it was eaten. We just counted that it was eaten. Um, so what are the possible implications for spread kind of to get to the heart of the matter? Well, we don't actually know. We didn't measure dispersal, but what we did do is we looked at the birds eating them and the time of the year. And we noticed that C. boldii potentially may have the higher potential to prolong distance C dispersal just because it was being eaten during fall migration by birds that are potentially migratory. Um, you know, and, and that the, the robins are, even if they're eating the seed, they're, they're, they're staying local and they're feeding in that park before they move on to another park. So they, they could make local jumps maybe, but maybe not these big long distance jumps that we're afraid of when we think about invasive species. A really interesting twist to this is that um, there's a paper from Japan uh, that I read that um, basically says the same thing that uh, my paper said, uh, but a different uh, uh, turtle species, which is that the fruit ripened at fall, nothing ate it, even in its native country, and the fruit remained uh, until winter, and then it was largely remain, uh, removed by another turtle species, um, so uh, native to Japan. So that was really interesting because it's like I think the reason a lot of times uh, invasive species are successful here is well, one they had they don't have predators, but they also find these mutualisms that exist in their native land, right? And so this could be another explanation as to why they're so, so successful. Um, so those are just the summary, but because we're running short on time, I'm just going to kind of blow through this because I want to talk about pollinators and, and pollination because I know that's of interest to, to everyone. So, um, so we set out to do some pollinator research and the thought behind this came from uh, Michael Donahue, Dr. Michael Donahue, who has been studying viburnum, you know, before I was born. And this is a paper that was, uh, you know, published about flowering times. You can see that there's a lot of overlap in these flowering times. Now, normally this wouldn't be an issue because something like these non-natives like C. boldii and prunifolium were never in contact. So who cares, right? It's not a big deal. Um, or requinitum and dentatum, they're not, they're not gonna come in contact with dilatatum because they're, they're, they're being used as ornamentals. They're not, they're not in our forests, but now they're in our forests. So I thought, oh, this is a really cool question. And so what I wanted to know is that if, Plants that have overlapping flowering times, are, are they using the same, um, uh, are they having the same pollinator resource? So are the same bees that are pollinating the natives also pollinating the non-natives? And so that was my hypothesis. Are there similar pollinating bee communities between the two? And, you know, you don't have to read this, but, but basically we already had an idea of what to expect because in previous years, when we were looking at uh, pollinators on just the invasives, we noticed that Andrina, this early springtime bee, was really important pollinator for, for both invasive species. And so we thought, well, this, this probably is going to be the same for the natives. So we set up field sites throughout New Jersey, uh, and we went out netting, and we did these pan traps, which are, are little just solo cups painted yellow, blue, and white and the little soapy water and, 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 and you can get an idea of what the bee population is in, in, at a certain site. And we also collected pollen because we were really curious if the pollen re rewards were the same between the native and in the invasive species. Unfortunately, due to COVID, uh, we never actually got to get the pollen analyzed. Uh, so I don't actually have data for that, but I'd be happy to talk more about it. Um, and so we, process them, we pin them, we sent them to the American Museum of Natural History. My collaborator, Sarah Kornbluth, did all the IDing, which is a great collaboration. And to, to, to confirm kind of what we thought, again, we found a lot and that Andrina was an, uh, a really important pollinator and that we were finding similar species of Andrina pollinating both shrubs. Unfortunately, Andrina is a really tiny bee and it's not one you can track easily. You can't put chips on because we wanted to follow up and see if we could see if they were visiting the same shrubs in the same day. Like, were they going to a native and then going to a non-native? Because, you know, it could, it could be helpful if there's more floral resources or it could pull 
and be a competition uh, between resources. And so we also set up B-Bowl just to see like, just to make sure is it, are we only seeing Andrina because Andrina's in the area or, or are there other bees? And no, there's plenty of other bees in the area, but Andrina seems to be really important to, to that process. Uh, yeah, I know I'm running out of time. Um, <laughs> so we also found the same thing with uh, the other species. And we also found that bees were, um, you know, that there are other bees besides Andrina found at these sites, but Andrina seemed to be the key bee species. And so um, when we think about bees and we think about the chance for hybridization, there's two things we need to keep in mind is that simply uh, viburnums can either have eight chromosomes or nine chromosomes. So something like Cebolii only has eight, where pruna and, and prunifolium has nine. So there's not a chance that they'll, they'll um, cross. And other species are poly, uh, not polymorphic. Uh, they have multiple sets of chromosomes. I'm, I'm blanking on the name. Um, you know, uh, and dentatum and, and dilatatum both have nine. Uh, nine chromosomes. But when you look, so uh, Egoff did this study in the 50s about can you get viable crosses? And he didn't find that you could get viable crosses with dentatum and dilatatum. You see there the number of flowers and the number of seeds harvested, and there's no seeds harvested, so they couldn't plant anything. It did actually see it with the T viburnum, but, but again, not a lot. Um, and the same thing with. Um, Prunifolium, um, even though they're different chromosome number, they actually can cross and produce viable seed, but then the number of plants produced are only two out of 36 seeds produced. So there's not actually a lot of chance out in nature for hybridization. Plus, um, they also don't match up sometimes. So like the T viburnum actually doesn't flower at the same time viburnum dentatum does. So it's actually would never be an issue in the real world, even if you could cross the two. So with the time left, I really actually want to leave time for questions because I, I, I went over, uh, but I did want to say that I have worked in some of these areas. These are some of the sites that I've done research in, and these are some of the sites that I found by Burnham in the past. Pelham Bay Park's got a lot of Seaboldii, and Cunningham Park has Seaboldii and, and Dilatatum. Um, I know you guys are really just would be responsible for Cunningham and Alley uh, Park and some of those others, but um, but, but what I guess, I guess the question I have for, for y'all is I don't, I, I was hesitant to talk about management options when I wasn't actually sure what kind of management you do, whether you use mostly you're cutting back or you're using herbicides. So I just wanted to open it up for questions because I'm pretty much done with the talk and, uh, and also just hear kind of what you, you all are doing to manage for viburnum. Yeah, folks uh, can put questions in the chat or comments about management. Tony, that was great, by the way, while we're waiting for comments. Excellent. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, 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 I didn't time it as well. As oh, I no, you're, you're fine, really. You know, you're good. Good timing. <laughs> we're good. Because we go till the meeting goes till 1.30, so we're, we're fine. Oh, okay. But uh, yeah, I'm going to definitely watch that again. And because uh, it the ID part helped me a lot. Good, I'm glad. And so I'm I, happy to- I can to... look at keys with lots of pages of keys, but I do better just looking at pictures. I'm a simple well, person, so your, and... photogra <laughs> your photographs are good. I like that. Yeah, That's well, very helpful. so many photographs from, you know, you collect a lot of viburnum photos when you're out in the field that much. Uh, so it's no worries. And I'm always, I, I said this to you guys personally when we were setting this up, but you know, I'm always happy to to come out and do a field day and just like put it into practice because it's one thing seeing photos, it's another thing having a viburnum by your side and trying to figure out what it is. So that would be great. We're gonna take you up on that. Yeah, for sure. Please. Any folks out there managing? The, the LISMA staff has been devoting a lot of time to surveying okay. different sites and trying to get a handle on uh, or assessing the situation with viburnums at some priority conservation areas. 
And yeah. uh, it's kind of thing where the, the more we look for the invasive viburnums, the more we find them. Yeah, I know. Well, so I, I mean, if nobody has a question, I, what I will say um, is that seabold viburnum is, is um, you know, can obviously spread by seed, um, but it, it's very clonal. And so it can be very tricky to manage. I know, you know, some folks um, like to use like, uh, you know, stump, like cut it and use stump treatments or try to treat it in, in sight and let it die back, you know. Um, uh, you know, I don't want to recommend any specific products that, you know, I'm not trying to favor one pesticide company over another, but triclopyr, you know, is one of those uh, ones that uh, is good for woody plants, uh, especially, you know, stuff that grows clonally, like it works pretty well on Tree of Heaven, which we all know is very clonal, very aggressive. I think it would probably do a pretty good job on Cebolii. With the dilatatum, um, it doesn't spread, it does, it can spread clonally. I don't, I don't see a lot of evidence, anecdotal evidence that it does. Um, you know, that, that could be another good candidate for trichopyr or glyphosate. Um, you know, the key with any of these is trying to get to them before the fruit get out, because even if you can knock out a population, you know, there's just a, there's a seed bank and you have to revisit these sites multiple years, you know? So if you knock back a population with like a work group and you're feeling good, like, you know, make sure you schedule like a year out, two years out, three years out. And just, you know, these seeds can stay in the seed bank seemingly for a while. I did some germination experiments. I don't have the data right now to show, but I, I had times where I planted stuff and it didn't come up because it needs uh, two cold periods a lot of times for viburnums uh, to, to break the dormancy. Um, so some, sometimes, you know, you plant something, you don't see it, um, and then you see it at two years from when you planted it, and you're like, oh, man, how did that come up? So viburnum can be a bit, bit tricky that way. So it's good to, when you treat or cut back to, to follow up with monitoring and try to get it uh, obviously before it gets established, but definitely before it fruits, because then you're, you know, it's, it's an uphill battle. Yeah. From what I hear, people who are controlling it is the cut stump. Yeah. Herbicide treatment is probably the most common. Uh, is V. Placatum showing up in unmanaged sites, any invasive tents? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I don't know. Not, not that I've seen... But I don't know. I folks on the ground. I haven't, I haven't been out, uh, so I don't know if like Kelly or Abby had a better insight on that. But I I've not seen it. Uh, you know, kind of be invasive. It's it's a native, but not to say that natives can't be invasive. They're, they're, they certainly can be certain species. But that that to me doesn't seem particularly aggressive. Are there any particular cultivars of Linda viburnum that you've seen escape? Yeah, yeah. But that's where I said it gets tricky because I don't know if it's Michael Dodge or Cardinal Candy or that. like I said, there's so many different cultivars. But yeah, there are some out there um, and the names are escaping me. I think there are some Michael Dodge out there. I, th I think there are some Cardinal Candy. There's uh, Hennekin. There's... Uh, there's one other that blanking, but yeah. And you can see the differences, especially in the fruit. Sometimes they're like more orange and then they are red, but they're still dilatatum. So, so with, the, with, with uh, cultivars like that, sometimes you have to do year round ID to really get it down to what you think it is. But at the end of the day, it's still an invasive, you know, who cares what cultivar it is. But yeah, yeah, that certainly does happen. All right, so if there are no more questions, I just, because it's always polite to do so, I just wanted to thank, uh, you know, all the folks that allowed me to do the work at the various parts. You know, I work with Fish and Wildlife Park Service, NJ Park Service, and a lot of other uh, counties and, and, and nonprofits to allow me to do the work that I was able to. Of course, I, I have to acknowledge Rutgers and NJT, where I graduated from, and all the 
different uh, botany fellowships from Garden Club and Tory and Ecological Society of America, as, long, as well as the Sydney S. Greenfield Botany Fellowship that allowed me to, to, to be able to do the work I could do. And then I also, of course, wanted to acknowledge all my collaborators and, and all the undergrads and other graduate students that helped uh, make this work possible. And, uh, you know, thank you. I I'm, 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 hope you enjoyed the presentation and I'm uh, always happy to come out and help key stuff out. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I, uh, 